thanks everyone for coming in. Uh, it's my first talk at Strange Loop, so you know, help me out. If the jokes are not funny, please still laugh. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm excited to uh, talk about cars. Uh, let's get started. So, uh, you know, first obligatory memes. Uh, cars is a topic that has a lot of hate on the internet, and uh, and as a security person, I work at Figma in security. Uh, I often have to explain cars to developers, and like such memes are very common. Actually, in the Slack channel, we have. Uh, Someone said they want to attend this course talk, although they hate it so much. So uh, hopefully you'll leave this enjoying course. But uh, you know, typically when we talk about cars, when I try to explain cars, I try to explain it's like, look, I'm trying to make a pizza tracker, a pizza tracker website, and cheese board, uh, you know, is a West Coast pizza place. And uh, and let's say I'm making a schedule JSON request, and like it returns the uh, the current schedule of uh, pizzas and if you haven't been to cheeseboard it's always gone it's the best uh, pizza and uh, it's always vegetarian uh, and uh, and there's some other thing that happens and usually what developers really get is requests have some access control request blah 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 there is an origin header and uh, and the responses have some access control allow blah 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 and uh, the browser somehow decides whether it's okay or not and keep trying until it works. Like that's kind of roughly what I've seen developers' experience with cars, and, and that's fine. If that's all you know, that's actually the base knowledge I'm expecting. Just there's something called access control request in the headers and access control allow in the responses. And now we'll figure out how cars works. Typically though, this is the other response, cross origin ritual sacrifice is the other meme I have often seen when talking about cars, and so we'll, we'll get better at it. Uh, and people just say, enable cars to all. It's, it's just you know, not, worth, not worth figuring out what's happening, let's just move on. And, uh, and that's it, like, I think there is like, a logic to cars that maybe we can figure out. So uh, you know, trying to explain cars technically is impossible. I feel like you know, complex things are best understood as a story. And so I'll try to explain the story of how cars came to be and what happened. And hopefully things make sense. Uh, now the title of the talk is Hipster History. Uh, despite living in Oakland, California, I was not high when I gave the title. Uh, it's uh, the, you know, I've realized that like, you know, to make history cool and interesting, you have to add all this like uh, hip cool stuff to it, otherwise no one listens. And so, uh, so like Hamilton, you gotta do something. And so in this talk, my real hope is like, you know, you leave this talk understanding why things are the way they are in cars. No one involved in cars defends it, it is awful, but, uh, <laughs> but you'll hopefully get less angry and live a happier life as a web developer. And, uh, and I'll be talking about a lot of people recapping the work of a lot of giants in the field, a lot of browser developers, W3C people, people who invented the web, and, and write stories, make jokes, but these are all people who I respect deeply and so and admire deeply. So just FYI, like, you know, if, if someone else sees this in the future, just, you know, no disrespect, it's just a mark of respect. Uh, all right, so, uh, so let's move on. 1989, important year, Taylor Swift was born. Uh, another thing that happened in 1989 was uh, Tim Berners-Lee wrote the first paper about the web. Uh, and, and another thing I'd like to point out here is that his paper had this nice comment, vague but exciting. And so I always remember this as an academic who has written papers in the past. If your paper gets uh, lame comments, don't be sad. Even the web, web paper had a comment that was vague but exciting. So you, know, you can build great things even with like reviewer comments being bad. Uh, and so Tim BL wanted to just have text with links. That was the dream. Uh, this is a photo from Tim Biel, the first browser and stuff he was developing. Uh, side note, this is Nicola Pello in the photo. Uh, she wrote the first multi-OS web browser. She was deeply involved in uh, creation of the web and the first Mac OS browser. And uh, somehow it's kind of sad that we've forgotten about her, but she was a great developer and a great engineer for the web. Uh, what happened after that though, I mean, Tim just wanted text with links, but some people in Illinois decided they wanted images, GUI, make it all fancy, and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and they wrote a paper called Ex Mosaic, and they had like, look, we can make this GUI. Even as early as that paper, the first web browser, uh, they wrote, you know, you write HTML documents by just like uh, copying it by viewing source. This was the place where view source was invented. And, uh, and you know, the other thing I really love about the Ex Mosaic paper, uh, is that one of the first reference in it is uh, the whole internet, the whole catalog. And so this was a time when the whole internet could be printed out and you could buy it from O'Reilly and, uh, and refer to it. <laughs> and so, so they were talking 92 really early on. 
And, uh, and so Tim Biel, I've heard, is not very happy about the fact that like, uh, people wanted to put images and all this stuff in the beautiful textual link web that he was envisioning. But, uh, but you know, it happened. And when you start talking about images, GUI, and making things better, you, know, you get venture, venture capital. Like you, you have people coming into you, and do you want money? Do you want to start a company? And so that's what happened to the folks working on this in Mosaic in Illinois. And uh, Mark Andreessen and Jim Clark went ahead and founded this company called Netscape. Uh, now, Netscape was the OG web browser uh, version 2 right here. It's like looks, I mean, this was like cutting edge when it first came out. It looks very old now, but like it was really cool. I mean, I remember using Netscape for the first time. It was super awesome. And uh, these guys decided like, you know, images and GUI aren't enough. We should add a scripting language. And uh, seems not that important. Let's just get some random new grad from Midwest and tell him, you know, just figure something out. We'll give you a couple of days. <laughs> And, uh, and let's call it something to do with Java, even if it is based on Scheme, uh, because that's what all the cool kids are doing in the 90s. And so, uh, you know, it was a crazy time, the 90s. And so, uh, so, you know, just come out to the West Coast and put Scheme in the browser. Uh, Brendan Eich was, uh, was fly, flown into the valley and did that. And so that's the, like, birth of JavaScript. Ah, so, yeah, the <laughs> JavaScript was born in this moment in, like, I think a week or three days. I forget the exact number. Uh, now, the thing about JavaScript is this is like a classic image of JavaScript, right? Like the book on the, uh, <laughs> the book on the right, the JavaScript, the good parts, is the book you should read. You should not read JavaScript, the definitive guide. Uh, the good parts is like really, and the image is pretty fitting, like, yeah. But the thing about the definitive guide is like, if you're like me, you're weird or interested in the history of things, the definitive guide has a lot of stuff. And so you crack it open, and, uh, and so understanding the security of JavaScript it has this great chapter. I go through it because uh, the quoting it is all I could do because it's just to me at least so shocking. Uh, and so they said like you know in Na Navigator 2.03 we were just like let's find bugs. If we find bugs, we'll fix them. Let's just keep yoloing it. And so anytime they found a bug, they'll add a fix called a hobble. That's literally what the book says, uh, the hobble. And we could keep hobbling things until we feel it's secure. And, uh, and so the original Netscape, you could just navigate with your JavaScript, like fetch about cache, and just fetch everything in the user's cache. And that's where you can read all the URIs the user has visited. And they're like, that's not great. We should hobble that. And let's not allow them to fetch about cache. And uh, you know, they gave up at some point. They're like, fine, we'll just give you an option to disable JavaScript. That's where like, it came from. Uh, I think finally, browsers have disabled the option to disable JavaScript. But, but like, it was added because they got tired of fixing all these JavaScript issues. Uh, finally, in like, you know, every time they released something, something new kept came, coming up, and they got tired of this. And they said, OK, we are going to create a general hobble that would end all security holes, which was like a big lie. I mean, it's been 20 years, and we're still <laughs> dealing with it. But, uh, but hopefully, it would spell an end to all security holes. And so the general hobble they created was, you know, you're not allowed to read anything other than your own website. So if you are example.com, you are allowed to read stuff related to example.com. Uh, this is the birth of the same origin policy, the core security policy. It was just like some people were like, we need to come up with a general hobble. And they came up with this that like, you can hit your own website. Now, <laughs> uh, I am an academic. Uh, my first paper was formally modeling uh, web security and same origin policy. And so reading this was very depressing. I wrote like a mathematical model of same origin policy. And to learn that it's completely based on some hobbles and people having fun was really sad. <laughs> but, uh, but it is what it is. Uh, so, so now, uh, you know, we have the same origin policy and the browser wars began. Uh, people started fighting for market share. And, uh, and so you can see this in the market share that like around 95, Internet Explorer was launched and Microsoft just started taking up more and more of the market share. Uh, Netscape and uh, stuff started losing market share. Netscape and other browsers started losing market share. By 2001, Microsoft said, you know what? We have won. No need to keep funding. The internet was, the web was a thing for a little while, but the future is really about, you know, I don't know, .NET apps or something. And so let's just shut it down. And, uh, and they did. Internet Explorer development shut down. And the W3C, which is the body like, set up to like, make the web better, uh, was like, you know what? The HTML is too ugly. We're going to rewrite to XML. Uh, things will be better. I don't know how many people remember X forms, X HTML, X everything. Uh, it was a bad time. Uh, good thing you don't know about it. Uh, and so, uh, so you know, the only thing that happened just before the uh, Internet Explorer development was shut down was there was some person. No one knows who this is. They are, I mean, people in Mozilla argue that they are the savior of the web. Some PM in Outlook said, you know what, the Outlook web app 
it really sucks that you have to navigate every time uh, you want to see something. So let's create this thing called XML HTTP request where you can fetch data. Uh, and, and so right before the development of IE, uh, IE ends, someone manages to sneak this in, this feature called XML HTTP request. Weird feature, like you know, the capitalization XML is like, uh, you know, camel case, HTTP is all capitalized, who knows what's happening. Uh, and so, uh, but you know, it's shipped, it's great. And, uh, and the same origin policy, the hobble that I talked about originally, said you can only hit your own website. So you can only hit your own origin. So you are example.com, you can only make an XML HTTP request to example.com. You can do whatever you want, you can put whatever headers you want, you can hit whatever URI you want, but it has to be the same origin. So they just inherited this general hobble that Netscape had implemented. And so that's where the classic XML HTTP request limits on requests came in, that you can only hit your own website. Okay, so now, Taylor Swift is 12 years old, writing her first song, and the web is 12 years old, and, uh, and what we have is Microsoft has shut down IE development, and W3C is only talking about XML. And so uh, some people have shipped, uh, you know, uh, Outlook Web App is not terrible, XHR is, are a thing, but browser developers are frustrated, like people outside of IE, you know, uh, WebKit and, uh, and stuff, they are frustrated, Opera, WebKit, all these browser developers are frustrated, and we have some bad blood between all the, <laughs> uh, and so, uh, so, sorry, that was like a really forced <laughs> joke, but, uh, but so that's when in 2004 we have the rebirth of HTML, and HTML5 was born. Bunch of engineers from Mozilla, Apple, Opera, just came together and was like, we want to stop talking about HTML, we want to talk about HTML, let's improve HTML, stop it with the XML talk. And, uh, and they started a working group, and like HTML5 is born. They didn't know what to call it, and so they just called it the What Working Group, and, uh, <laughs> and they came up with a backronym, like Web Hypertest Application Technology Working Group, but, uh, but I'm told by some people that was really just a made-up thing, because they found it funny. Uh, so the What Working Group came out with HTML5, uh, and, and now they started ideating. They started thinking about new stuff we could do on the web. Lots of cool stuff, video, audio, all of that came out during this period. But the thing they did focus on was XML HTTP request also. They said, why can't my JS make third party requests? And you know, the security people were like, security, like of course, you can't, like, oh my God. And uh, said, well, I can already do this with image tags, form tags, script tags. And said, so, well, you know, it's only a get, and, and you can't read the response. You can just render it, and like, we try to not let you read the response. And so the, the people writing the specs were like, okay, we'll only make such requests, and reading is not allowed without permission. So we will allow them to make requests using JS that are already allowed, cross-origin requests, and, uh, and we'll allow reading the responses only with permission. So the key thing to like, sort of understand course is this bit. Like, we only want to allow things that were already allowed with image tags, script tags, form tags and allow reading the response on permission. This was to keep compatibility with the existing web. So they're walking this thin rope, tight rope on like, how do we achieve this? And this is how they achieved it. They called this the course simple request mode. And the idea is only allow things that are already allowed. And so get requests are allowed. You can't add any extra headers because you couldn't do that with image tags and script tags. It's a simple get request that is allowed. And you can make a post request because you can make it with the form tag but the post request must be of the www form encoding, because that's the only encoding that the form tag allowed. So anything that's a get request without extra, extra headers or extra magic is allowed, and a post request with form encoding is allowed. Reading responses has to be opt-in, because you couldn't read an image tag even if you include it in your website. And so they added this thing that was like, okay, we'll add an origin header in the request, and the server can respond with access control allow origin to let us read the response. And if the access control allow origin names the origin, it is allowed. And, and there was another detail was, if the request had cookies, then you also had to say access control allow credentials. And so that's the core course magic, which is just try to maintain the sort of requests that were already allowed and force the server to make a choice on whether reading is allowed or not. And so that's where the like, you know, image of course, the simple cause request, you just make a get request, there's an origin header, and the response has to control, access control, allow origin, in this case, parkstack.com. So there are some quirks, of course, because it wouldn't be the web without quirks. And so uh, ACAO, access control, allow origin, wanted to be secure by default. And so it only supports one value in the response. You can't give an array, you can't give like a blob, star.foo.com, anything like that is not allowed. You have to have a single value that is fully correct in the response. They wanted to be really sure that they're not introducing any security issues. 
And you had, this is annoying because like you had to check the origin against the list of allowed headers and then respond with the exact origin that matched. You couldn't like just write it once and go. Uh, and this is sad because you, know, you want to have a simple static site that's just like here's general knowledge, like public domain stuff that is available to everyone. How do you want to allow that? And, and so the response was like, you know, can't I just start using star? Can't I just say everyone is allowed to read this? And the concern with the designers of the core, uh, core setting was that star was already a thing on Flash. Cross-domain requests with Flash allowed you to set star, and pretty much anyone who said that, had, uh, said that, said that had a security vulnerability. And so they said, how do we avoid these sort of security vulnerabilities? And so they said, we'll allow star on responses, ACAO, allow origin star, but only if you don't send cookies. The idea is that if you make a request without cookies, it cannot be private to you, it cannot be secret, it is just a free public resource. There is no authentication on that request. And so access control allow origin star only works if you make a request without cookies. Anytime you include cookies and the server responds with access control allow origin star, it's a network error. The funny thing about this is that unintentionally, I'm pretty sure, they've made the most secure setting for any page ever. If you are not sure what access control allow origin setting to set, just set it to star and it's almost always safe. There is, it's almost impossible to screw this up because with cook, like it will just fail. The browser will not allow the request with cookies. And so ACAO star is one of the safest settings to put. You can just put it everywhere, it's fine. So, recapping, uh, simple requests were created to just recreate what HTML, simple HTML could, could already do. And bob.com can allow alice.com with uh, access control allow origin alice.com and add allow credentials true if they also want to allow requests with cookies. And you can set access control allow origin star, but requests with cookies will fail. And this is one of the safest HTTP headers that you can set. Give you one moment, moment to read it while I drink some water. All right, of course, you know, we wanted more. Uh, we're not happy with that. And so, uh, so what if I wanted to make a complex request? What if, uh, you know, I wanted to make something that was a put or that was a delete? Like, and they said, well, the security people said, you can't, the site might not want you to. I said, well, why can't we let the site decide? And the security people, how will the site even know? Are you, how do you make the, make the site decide? The site might not even be ready for it. It might be a 20 year old website. And so the spec designers came up with the idea of like, let's use a really annoying HTTP method that no one will ever use. And just the fact that you're willing to respond to this really annoying unheard of HTTP method means that you know what course is. And so then we can figure out this handshake. And, and everyone said, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And, uh, <laughs> and so, and so, uh, so, so that came out, that ended up with this thing we call the course pre-flight request. The idea of the pre-flight request is that if it's not a simple request, and simple request is what was already allowed, if it's not a simple request, first make an options request, because no one speaks options. Put everything that the JS is trying to do in the options request. So say these are the request headers that the JS wants to add. So access control allow request headers, other things the JS wants to add. Put uh, access control request method based on the HTTP method that the JS wants to use. So if it's delete, it will say access control request method delete. And put the origin in the origin header. So that's the pre-flight request that the browser implicitly makes. So you are making an XHR cross origin, you have added a header or something, and magically in the background, the browser has added another request. The server can respond saying like these methods are allowed, these headers are allowed, and this is how long access control allow max age, this is how long you remember my choice. And after that, if everything looks good, the allowed headers matches the requested headers, the allowed uh, you know, method matches every, uh, the requested method, then the browser will actually make the request. It will still check access control allow origin and allow credentials like the simple request in this final request. So options is a request, the pre-flight request, the options request is a request to check if the request is allowed. And then the final request again keeps the normal course uh, semantics that you wanna check allow origin and stuff like that. And the pre-flight pre -flight cache expires, you do the pre-flight again. And so this leads to this more, slightly more complicated diagram of uh, you know, when you want to make, a, a, let's say, get request with an authorization header, the, uh, the client will first make an options request saying, you know, I want a request method get and request headers authorization. The server responds with like, yes, uh, get and options are allowed and allow authorization header is allowed and then you can actually make the get request with the authorization header. So for cross origin request. 
this is a perf disaster. It's a terrible idea. Please don't do it. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's a randomly added complicated round, round trip request before every request you make. And originally, when it was shipped, pre-flight caching was also capped at 10 minutes. And if you made a slight change, because the, the setting was tied to every URI, you make a slight change to the query parameter or anything like that, it's a new pre-flight request. There's no way to cache pre-flight requests meaningfully. And so RESTful URI design, where you include like something in the REST URI, uh, is just dead. Because like every time you try to make any request to an API, it will cause a pre-flight request, which is a whole round trip uh, to the server. And you have to add this code to correctly handle options pre-flight request. So running like a static CDN or something like that will not work. So this is my typical advice to most developers. If you find yourself tired and dealing with complex core requests and trying to understand pre-flight requests, uh, complain to your performance team. Uh, the performance team will usually come in and say, can we stop using complex requests? Because it's such a perf disaster. It is so slow, it makes things unnecessarily slow, and like, it's just generally not a good idea. And, uh, and you can typically get away, in my experience, by not having to go into complex requests. Stop using, uh, you know, like just change the content type from JSON to form encoding make a post with that rather than delete and stuff like that. And you can typically avoid uh, pre-flight requests. You can typically avoid complex requests. And so you, my general advice is just like try to stick to simple cost request. It's easier to understand, which is why I think it's also secure. And, uh, and it's much faster. So now, you know, with all this work, we finally have this thing called course. Course exists. And like with all good things, now that it exists, let's use it everywhere. And so these are the other places you might have seen cars. And so, you know, if you want an opt-in security model, web fundamentally was an opt-out security model. You could return with a 400, but typically you could just include resources from anywhere. But you wanted an opt-in model where the web server has to explicitly tell the browser, no, really allow this, you could use cars. Uh, so one example was font. Fonts wanted to, font factories wanted to protect their IP, uh, didn't want to give permission to use the font without like copyright licenses and everything. And so unlike, images, scripts, styles, video, audio, including font from a third party is a course request. The font server has to return with access control allow origin that explicitly allows your origin to fetch that font. So this is a common source of frustration because it's so at odds with everything else in the web, but this is why it exists, because during the specification of the fonts API, a request was made that, no, we really want an opt-in model for security when it comes to fonts. Uh, if you want to allow you know, Alice.com to monitor performance of file loads from CDN.com, how do you do that? Well, the CDN could start returning access control allow origin, and now Alice can read the image, the JavaScript. And so if you return access control allow origin, the browser will also give detailed performance and timing information to Alice.com, and that lets you write better uh, websites. How do you check the hash of a third-party resource before loading? So sub-resource integrity is a spec that lets you say, you know, this is the script uh, that I want to load. This is the SHA-2 of the script I want to load. You know, if you, if you didn't check permissions, then you could brute force the, uh, the value of the script, third-party script. And so sub-resource integrity also requires cores before checking any hashes or integrity. So that was a lot of complicated stuff. Uh, this is how cores works. <laughs> uh, before we dig in more, maybe uh, any one or two questions anyone have? Uh, well, I always Google and say, what is simple request? And uh, Mozilla has a great page on it. But the intuition behind it is whatever was already allowed on the web with like HTML. So whatever you could do with image SRC, like an HTML tag. So image SRC, script SRC, form, form action, like all these things. Whatever you could do with simple HTML before JavaScript existed, let's say, is a simple request. So that's the intuition. Exact details are in like a Mozilla article. But yeah, I, would, so I tend to think about the intuition behind it as like, this is what's allowed in HTML, so it must be a simple request. Yeah, so the question was, uh, who's doing the complex pre-flight? Like, where is it enforced that this pre-flight happens, I believe? Uh, so that's enforced by the browser. So when you make that XML HTTP request API call locally in JavaScript, the browser will implicitly do the options request. Uh, the, the threat model here is that the server might not even know about cores. Maybe it's a 30-year-old server. So the browser needs to check with the server, am I allowed to make this request? So yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so just to repeat what he said, like, yeah, cores is only a concept for browsers in JavaScript making requests, really. But like, uh, mostly browsers, there are other cases. But like, yeah, fundamentally, cores is about the browser. Uh, and what requests are allowed by JavaScript. Because browser is really the only place where you're running arbitrary, untrusted JavaScript. So they have to worry about security a lot more than something like curl or Python. All right. 
we're going to uh, jump to more details as things get crazy, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and things are going to get more crazy. So uh, hopefully, you're starting to get the intuition behind course, but, but let's make slightly more fun things happen. Uh, so you know, all that browser war history happened, and then around 2008, Chrome launched and basically has taken over the browser market share. And one of the great things about Chrome was its big security push that I, you know, being a security person I'm a big fan of, was uh, Chrome started doing auto updates, like the browser will auto update all the time, and uh, Chrome had sandboxing. So it isolated the renderer, the thing that runs the web page from your computer. Uh, another fun thing about this is like the auto updates when Chrome first launched them was very controversial. Security people were complaining that this is insecure. So yeah, another reminder that like sometimes good things are unpopular, so it's fine. Uh, uh, so what was Chrome's sandboxing model? The idea of Chrome's sandboxing model was that let's say you know you are a browser, you make a request to some evil.com server. Uh, let's say the server has an exploit for Chrome and and really you know buffer overflow all the security magic, and somehow the renderer is now running the attacker's code the hacked renderer now cannot read your local files. It cannot read your local computer files, anything secret, anything private you have on your computer. This was a big deal in 2008. Before that, you know, one exploit of the browser and it's game over. Everything on my computer is visible to the attacker. The only problem with this was uh, Chrome also told me to switch to, uh, <laughs> switch to Gmail and all this, like move all my email to the cloud. And so even though the hacked renderer process can't read my local files, it can just say, hey, I want to read uh, gmail.com. The user just typed, let's navigate to gmail.com. And, and so now, even though my local computer is secure, my email is completely host. My Facebook, my Instagram, like everything is completely host. And so sandboxing the renderer isn't really achieving a lot of the security as we move more and more things to the web. It is a big win. It is a significant improvement than historical browsers, but it's still an issue. You are not actually isolating your sensitive data this way. So Chrome said, OK, let's move each tab to its own process. Uh, and so attacker.com, uh, hacked, uh, hacked renderer, navigates to Gmail. Uh, that navigation is not allowed. The only thing that will be allowed is we'll create a new process from scratch that we know is safe, and we'll then do the request to navigation request to mail.google.com. And so this way, you're guaranteed that like, you know, navigating to sensitive sites like Gmail is always a safe bet, that you're not going to run untrusted stuff, stuff on Gmail. Uh, untrusted uh, renderers will not be able to hit Gmail. So simple trick, there's a lot of complexity here around like managing processes and stuff, but like Chrome really pushed this and significantly improved security this way. Here's the problem where cross-origin requests come up though. Uh, attacker.com can just say imgsrc mail.google.com and can fit, still fetch email. So even though you have blocked navigation and said navigation to Google or Gmail has to be a new tab, the hacked renderer can just say, oh, I want to fetch Gmail as an image. Browser doesn't know that's not an image. The browser, for, for the browser, everything is a URI. So the browser says, sure, here's Gmail uh, and everything in the body. And the attacker.com compromise process can just read everything in it. This is really like the core bug of the web. Like from the very beginning, the web allowed arbitrary third party requests. And, uh, and like we really are still paying for that complexity. And as I'll talk through today, we are trying to fix that. So Chrome came up with a new browsers, all came up with a new spec called cross-origin read blocking, CORB, if you haven't had enough of the core uh, uh, <laughs> acronyms. Cross-origin read blocking says, you know, if you try to load image src mail.google.com, it will block all HTML and XML. So you're not allowed to load HTML and XML MIME types into your page via an image tag or a script tag or JavaScript XML HTTP request or anything like that. And the idea is that hopefully you don't have sensitive images and scripts like that but you know, your sensitive data is in HTML or XML. That's a reasonable design. Most people keep like static stuff on images and scripts, and they do HTML and XML as the sensitive data. So cross-origin read blocking CORB was to say MIME type enforcement, that you cannot load HTML and XML as an image tag or a script tag or XHR and stuff like that. Well, this didn't work because uh, you know, sometimes I might actually have secret images. How do you block that? So then we came up with a new spec called CORP, uh, to keep it confusing. Uh, <laughs> it's called cross-origin resource policy. And CORP is, uh, you know, I want to block all cross-origin reads. How do I do that? Using CORP. And so cross-origin resource policy lets you say cross-origin, uh, it's a header you can put on your responses that says cross-origin resource policy, same origin, for example. Or you can say same site, or you can say cross-origin. So these headers let you say, allow a third-party site to read this response. 
And so this way you can tell the browser who can, be re who can read my response, who can load my response. And so this way you can limit your attack surface. If you have a sensitive image that you only want your website to load, you can put a header that says cross origin resource policy, same origin, and no one other than your own website can load this image or a script or whatever. But remember, same origin policy is a hack. Uh, doing all of this still doesn't make us secure because attacker.com can still open a pop-up to mail.google.com. So let's say you go, you know, and this is something we want, right? Like you are on a website, you want to be able to open iframes and pop-ups and st stuff like that. And because iframes and pop-ups can talk to each other through synchronous communication mechanisms, the browser cannot put each of them in a separate process. So currently in Chrome, for example, all of these things, the iframe, the pop-up, different websites are all together in the single process. And the single process that has all the iframes and the you know, browsing tree, the pop-ups, everything, is called a browsing context. But maybe we are fine. You know, <laughs> that was the assumption for years that like, yes, this is, but it's a really annoying attack. No one will do it. Maybe we are fine. And then this happened, uh, Spectre and Meltdown. Uh, these two attacks were, uh, you know, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, it just, things got very complicated with CPU and hardware. <laughs> uh, uh, every time I try to explain Spectre and Meltdown, I get a headache, and so I'm not gonna try. Uh, but in general, think of Spectre like this, that if you have JavaScript running, if you can tell br the browser to run a particular set of JavaScript, and the browser gives you a fine-grained timer, like a clock, uh, you can read any, process, any memory in the whole process. It doesn't matter if it's JavaScript memory or not, it doesn't matter if it's isolated, you don't know the map, whatever. You can read any memory throughout the process if you can run JavaScript and you can measure time. That's it. So Spectre really messed up the ability to isolate stuff inside a process. To, after Spectre, we couldn't really rely anymore on being able to isolate things inside a process. What did browsers do? Uh, browsers just took away the ability to measure time. They said, you know, now you can only measure time at like very coarse grained intervals. Earlier you could measure time to very fine grained intervals for performance measurements and stuff like that, but now you can't. And so just to make the attack more concrete is that like, you know, if you are, uh, a, like the previous image I showed, uh, you know, your A dot example loading B in iframes and stuff, if it's evil.com, uh, you can just read everything from B dot example using Spectre because it's all in the same process. Browser started blogging, uh, blocking fine-grained timers and low-level primitives around memory management. Like anything new that was sort of more fine-grained, browsers just started blocking, saying it's too sensitive, Spectre will really mess things up. Now the problem with blocking fine-grained timers is like there are applications that we want to build that are very interesting, that we want to put on the web. You know, Gmail, for example, manages its own memory. It's doing very fine-grained uh, you know, control over how memory is managed, how performance is managed. I really want more fine-grained timers. I want low-level primitives. Can you tell the browser, like, look, I'm just trying to create a web app that is like, you know, smart, fast, and uh, well-managed. Can you just isolate me and give me more powerful features? And this is where the last two uh, cross-origin primitives and specs come in, Coop and Coip. Uh, that's how I pronounce them. No, no one else is here to correct me. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but let's talk about them. Uh, remember the intuition, though. The idea is to tell the browser, I just want to write a web app. Please don't talk to me about Spectre. Just isolate me and let me do whatever I want. That's kind of the main aim of COOP and COEP. So cross-origin opener policy, uh, for example, in Gmail's case, can now say, you know what, any cross-origin thing that I'll open, it will always be same origin. If I try to open a cross-origin uh, pop-up or a cross-origin iframe, uh, you know, you can block it or you can remove all handles to it so I can't talk to it synchronously, and the browser will now enforce that. So this is a way to tell the browser that I have designed my web app to be isolated, please assume you can isolate me completely, and any time I try to open anything cross-origin, an iframe or a pop-up, just block it or, or you know, don't let me connect to it via handle or anything like that. So now, because of this, the browser knows that there is no synchronous communication between the iframe and the pop-up and the main page. And so it can put that pop-up in a separate process. Because when you're in the same process, you can do synchronous. Uh, when you're in a different process, you cannot do synchronous communication. So the browser knows, oh, let's isolate them, put them in a separate process. The other policy that Gmail can put in is cross-origin embedder policy. Uh, this says that any time I load anything third party, images, scripts, or anything like that, I'll only load it if I'm explicitly allowed by CORS or, uh, or CORP. So cross-origin request policy is what I talked about earlier. Gmail can say, I will load only stuff that I'm explicitly allowed. 
you know, historically you could in include things from anywhere using image tag and, and the server didn't have to explicitly opt you in. The cross origin embedder policy changes that to say no, anything you include in your web page has to be explicitly allowed by the server. The server has to say, allow this website to read everything. So what does that mean? So cross origin opener policy says, I will not open a pop-up, I will not use synchronous APIs, I know what I'm doing, you can isolate me into my own process. And browsers will allow asynchronous APIs, so post message and stuff, but this means that pop-ups can be a separate process. Uh, cross origin embedder policy says anything I include, I'll get full read access. I'm already allowed to read it, and so you can put it in the same memory as my process. And so what this allows the browsers to say is that your renderer process, in the, like in the example I was giving Gmail, only loads content that is allowed to lead, uh, read. So in the process that you have, you're only really loading content that you're allowed to read. And so I can give you fine grain timers, I can give you low level control because I'm not worried about Spectre because you have full read access on everything in your memory anyhow. So Spectre is no longer a risk. And so we finally come to the full list of like specs we have talked about today. Uh, and yeah, like it doesn't get less annoying. Uh, <laughs> but uh, course, you know, if there's one thing you take away, course, there are simple requests, you know, allow JS to make requests that are already allowed and add a permission check. There are complex requests saying if it's not a simple request, do a pre-flight and see if the request is allowed and then continue with the previous logic. Corb says I will not allow HTML to be loaded as an image tag or a script tag and stuff like that. Corp says don't allow anyone else to include me, so it's a server-side header. You can say I don't want to be loaded on any other web page, so let me set a cross-origin resource policy. Don't allow anyone else to load me. Coop says don't give me any synchronous handles if I load a cross-origin pop-up. COEP uh, says block any cross-origin loads to my process unless I can fully read everything in it. And so cars, carp, carp, coop, coop. Uh, we have a great uh, situation here. Uh, <laughs> but, but hopefully uh, with this, uh, things hopefully start making sense. This is kind of the story of how we got there, different vulnerabilities, different issues, us trying to fix issues. And this is how we got to this complex situation of carps, carp, and all this stuff. Uh, Thanks. Uh, this is a DALI, uh, DALI created image, but thanks a lot for listening to me. <laughs> thanks.